Mark Twain, who died about a hundred years ago, is reputed to have said, It ain't the parts of the Bible that I can't understand that bother me. It is the parts that I do understand. And a century later, I think his comments are very valid. Society has changed a lot and we have modified a lot of the values of society to suit our needs. And I think what Mark Twain was trying to say is there are some biblical principles which are uncomfortable for us and we don't like it and often we'll change what our views are of it in, in order to please ourselves and to make our lives easier. But we need to understand they've been set out by God and we need to see what is it that God is trying to say to us. Now, the Bible could be a confusing book. It may be difficult to understand, but it is God's word. It is the gradual revelation of God, his character, his relationship, his status. And it's a picture of who he is. And it really is necessary for us in order to understand how to relate to him. It tells the story of how we were created and how we were deemed to be the pinnacle of God's creation. We were the ones made in God's image. We are the ones that most reflect actually who God is. It tells how we broke that relationship with God and how God purposed to restore that relationship. And it does this through a series of images or pictures stories that God tells which give some indication of how he's going to restore that relationship again. There's a beautiful verse in 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul, who is talking about the things to come, refers to the things that currently are and saying how they are a picture of what's to come. And he says the spiritual did not come first, but the natural, and after that the spiritual. And so throughout scripture we have, we have two lives often, one portraying the natural, and then one portraying the spiritual. Um, so what we have throughout the Old Testament really is, is God through a series of pictures or images trying to show us really how he's going to restore that relationship. So we have situations like a slave being set free or a prisoner having his debt paid and then released, um, a boat saving people from a flood, from drowning, a father sacrificing his beloved son, or a goat being cursed and sent off into the wilderness to die. These are all symbolic of God's love for us and of his supreme effort to restore that relationship that we broke. But of all these images throughout the Old Testament, throughout Scripture, the most powerful one is that of a marriage relationship between a man and a woman. The marriage ceremony that we know today eventually developed into a formal agreement and it became one of the types of blood covenants that existed in ancient cultures. There are many examples in scripture, but all blood covenants had seven basic elements. And I just want to touch on those seven, but to remind you that we're actually dealing with a marriage covenant here and all of these were part of that marriage covenant. So one of the things that happened in a marriage covenant uh, in a blood covenant and therefore in a marriage covenant is there would be an exchange of coats and belts. It wasn't just a, a clothing exchange really but what it was symbolizing your cloak, your outer garment was symbolic of your status in life, your wealth, who you really were. Uh, and your belt was the thing that carried your weapons. So when you took off your cloak and your belt and you gave it to somebody else what you were saying is all of my status, all of my wealth, all of my possessions is at your disposal. All of my strength is yours. If you need someone to defend you, I'm there for you. That's what you were saying when you did that. Um, in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 3 and 4, we have this uh, beautiful example of David and Jonathan. There are many covenants in Scripture, but I'm just going to highlight a few as we go through. We're a very unequal covenant, if you like. Jonathan is the son of a king, and, Daniel's, uh, and David is just a shepherd boy. He's an insignificant status in life. And yet the two of them love each other and make a covenant with each other. Um, and it says, Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. He stripped himself of his robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. So here he was saying, I am the king's son and everything that I have, I actually want to give to you. I want to help you. I want to show you how much I actually want to support you. Um, so that was the, the first thing they often did was this symbolic ritual of saying all that I have is yours and all that you have is mine. Uh, the second thing they did was that 
it would be the probably the most graphic symbol of all and something which we've lost in today's society it was a binding covenant and today contracts and covenants aren't worth the paper they're written on often you wonder how long they're going to last but in those days it was so binding that they were a graphic symbol to illustrate how permanent this covenant was uh, even paul 2000 years ago and well into the situation of these covenants dealing with many pagan cultures when he describes marriage he talks about uh, in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 39 he says the woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives it wasn't a, a let's try this and see how it works out but he understood that it was a permanent relationship it was a once only and it, it really was symbolic of what God is saying to us God didn't try one thing and then another thing and another. God actually made a plan. He had one plan for us and he worked through that plan until it came to fruition. And so marriage is meant to symbolize that also. And so what they did, uh, they would take an animal, they would kill an animal, they would cut it in half, very bloody, gory situation, and they would walk through the, the carcasses, the two halves of the carcass, and end up meeting each other in the middle of this uh, bloody carcass and they would then make promises to each other. And what they would do effectively after making these promises, they would point to the carcasses and say, God do so to me and more if I break this covenant with you. It, it was symbolic of them walking through death for the other person and saying, I will never and ever break this covenant. If I break this covenant, that is what must happen to me. And they would point to the dead animal. Now, you may not be aware of this, but up until a generation ago, in many marriage ceremonies, modern marriage ceremonies, there was a certain ritual and there were certain uh, promises that were written into it and people would read the site and it became ritualistic. Today, we, we often write our own vows to each other, but there was a standard set of vows that people would often use. And one of them comes from the book of Ruth. Uh, Ruth had married somebody and her husband had died. So she was actually no longer bound to her husband. But back in those days, a marriage ceremony was often more than just between a man and a wife. It often involved the two families and sometimes even the two communities from which they came. And one of the things they did was if a woman married a man, she left the protection of her father who'd been looking after her, and she was now being handed over to another man who would protect and care and look after her. And she would make a promise to say, although I used to serve my family and my family's gods, I will now serve this man's family and his gods. Uh, it was a very, very uh, complete contract that they were making. And when Ruth's husband died, she was no longer bound to those things anymore. Yet, when Naomi left to go back to her home, Ruth actually said to her, Don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. And, and then here comes the interesting part. This is what was said at the end of the covenant when they stood uh, amongst these two carcasses. She said, May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. She understood what that covenant meant, that she was not going to turn back uh, on her promises that she'd made to that family. Uh... Jacob and Laban are two people who made a covenant with each other too, but it was really a covenant because they didn't trust each other. And when they leave each other also, they separate from each other physically. The one goes to, to live in his own house far from the other one. They made a covenant because Jacob had married Laban's daughter. And Laban says, may the Lord keep watch between us when we are separate. And when we were out of each other's sight, if you mistreat my daughters or take other wives, no one else is with us. Understand that God will be a witness between you and me. So he was saying that although, although we're not here to see that we follow the terms of the covenant we made, God is going to be the witness. If you break that covenant, God will deal with you. And then an, an interesting verse that comes out of Jeremiah, which if you've read it, you may have wondered what's going on here. But God is speaking through the prophet Jeremiah to the group of, of the Israelites and saying, you've actually broken my covenant. And this, the covenant was a symbolic thing, which because God couldn't be seen, the people that represented the nation of Israel broke this covenant. 
And he says, those who violated my covenant and have not fulfilled the terms of the covenant they made before me, I will treat like the calf they cut in two and then walked between its pieces. The leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the court officials, the priests, all the people of the land who walked between the pieces of the calf, I will deliver into the hands of their enemies who want to kill them. Their dead bodies will become food for the birds and the wild animals. Now, that is really graphic, but that is, that is what was happening. When people made a covenant, it was a permanent thing. You couldn't turn back from it. You couldn't break it. Because what you're saying is, God must do this to me if I break the covenant. That was how important it was. It was to these people. Uh, some of the other things they did, they would cut their wrists or their forearms, and often they would clasp them together like this so that the blood flowed between them, sort of in, interpreting that as being a mingling of the two families, the, the two people that were making the covenant, and I think that's probably where our shaking of hands comes from. Um, but what it would do, it would leave a permanent scar in your wrist, and every time you stretch forward like this, you would see the scar in your wrist, other people would see it. They would know that you are not all there is. There's more to you than just you. They would know there's another person that's indicated by the scar on your wrist here. So I suppose it would be difficult to try and choose a fight with that person because you didn't know how big or how strong the other half of you was that they couldn't see. Um, now, for the nation of Israel, the, the symbolism of the, the scarring in their flesh was the circumcision. When God made a covenant, when it started with Abram, he said, all of your male children must be circumcised on the eighth day uh, after they're born. And that was a, a permanent scar in their flesh, which, which would remind them that they'd made a covenant, entered into covenant with God. Then they would take on the other person's name as part of their name after that. So the two names would become lengthened, and that would be another indication to other people, to the community, that you weren't all there was. There was another part to you that they couldn't see. Um, and again, the, probably the best symbol of that happening is when Abraham and God made a covenant, Abraham, Abram's name was changed to Abraham, adding that ha sound, and Sarai's name became Sarah. Uh, the, the name of God at that stage was unpronounceable, but it was very strongly, there was an H sign in it, which is a Y-H-W-H was, was the way it was written. Um, and so that H being added to Abram's name was an indication that God had added his name to a man's name. And from then on, God became known as the God of Abraham. And the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that God would take on a human being's name as part of his name was just quite incredible. They would also erect... Um, a monument. The monument really served as a reminder to future generations. And the monument would be something fairly permanent. In those days, the most permanent thing they could get was a stone or a rock. And they would usually uh, put a pile of stones together or a single rock, which would become their monument that other people would pass by and know that this rock was a monument to the covenant that these people had made. Um, that Joshua, at the end of his life, when he's about to die, and he's going on and he's led the people into the promised land and they've settled into their places and he's trying to remind them now, don't forget the God who gave you all of this. Remember the covenant that you made with him. And it says in Joshua 24, right at the end, he, Joshua made a covenant for the people and there at Shechem he reaffirmed for them the decrees and the laws that God had given them. Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law and he took a large stone, set it up there under the oak tree near the holy place and said, see, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. So future generations would see the stone. They would ask their parents, what does the stone mean? And their parents could explain to them the covenant that they had made with God. Then they would often eat a meal at the end to symbolize the, the ritualistic ending of, the, of this formal agreement now, usually just a, a meal of bread and wine. Um, Jacob and Laban did the same that night when they made that covenant, even though they didn't really trust each other. But what I found the most fascinating meal that was ever eaten is when Moses was given the commandments, when he was given the law, at the end of that, he and the 70 elders of Israel who represented the nation of Israel went up into the mountain and they sat down and they had a meal with God. That is just the most incredible thing. Exodus 24, it says, Moses, Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet, 
was something like a pavement made of lapis lazuli, as bright blue as the sky. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God and they ate and drank. So they finished that covenant meal with God, symbolizing that they were sealing the covenant with him. Now, the most wonderful thing about these covenants was the children who were part of the family that made this covenant, and even children who hadn't been born yet, were automatically included in the covenant. Uh, and so, although your child couldn't understand what was going on when you made this formal agreement, in years to come, they could have the terms of the covenant explained to them, and then they would understand what their father had got themselves into. They could then choose and say, fantastic, this is wonderful, I'm part of this. Or they could say, no, 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 I don't want to buy into this, and they could exclude themselves. But until then, when they could make a decision for themselves, they were automatically included. Uh, and the example of that is at the end of Moses' life, before he dies, uh, he reminds the people of Israel that they were actually unfaithful to God and that God said, as a result of that, you are not going to see the promises I made you in the covenant that I made with you, but your children who couldn't decide and were too small to understand, they will be the ones that benefit in Deuteronomy 1 verse 39. So, so those are all the, the aspects of a covenant, and I want you to think of those in terms of a marriage relationship because the marriage covenant was one of these covenants, one of these types of covenants. And as we've said before, it was normally between two people or two parties of similar standing, very seldom an unequal uh, party or an unequal covenant. That It was, in fact, unthinkable for God to make a covenant with people. If you look at all the ancient cultures, there was never that kind of relationship. The people always feared their God, and they, they did things out of fear that their God would do something to them. Here was a God who actually said, I want to restore a relationship with you. I want to make a covenant with you. I want to give you everything that I've got. It was just unthinkable for God to do that, but he did. So God made man in his own image, and he called all of his creation in front of Adam, and Adam could see, actually, none of these creatures are like me. I'm different. There's something different about me. And then God took Adam and made him into two people. He, he sort of took half of him and separated him. And in such a way, God was showing that the true characteristic of God is, is not just one thing, but there's a male part, there's a female part. All of those characteristics are necessary to reveal the true nature of God. And the overwhelming attraction that a man and a woman have for each other the physical, the biological, the spiritual attraction, the desire to come together is part of God showing you the overwhelming love that he has for us uh, and how he wants to draw us towards him. And so the marriage ceremony and the marriage relationship is probably the, the ultimate picture of what God is trying to show how much he really loves us. Ephesians chapter 5, where Paul is talking about the marriage relationship, he says in chapter 5 verse 31, Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. It's a reversal of what God did with Adam, where he separated Eve from Adam to show Adam that there's a desire to be together again. There's a desire for God to bring us towards him. In the same way, God is saying this reversal now, a man and a woman coming together and becoming one is actually the mystery. He says this mystery is profound, but I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. And he's saying that, that when a man feels a desire for a woman and a woman wants to be joined to a man and the two become one, as Adam and Eve did, that is actually what God is saying is, is the love that I have for my people and how I want to become one with you. So this joining together of a bride and a bridegroom, man and woman, is really a picture that God paints so often throughout Scripture. Almost all of the prophets refer to the nation of Israel as a woman or as a wife who has gone away and left her husband, and God is trying to call her back again. Uh, and, and if you read through the, the Old Testament prophets, that recurring theme comes up over and over again. It's a woman, it's a wife who's left her husband, and the husband is desperate to call her back and to get her back again. Uh, 
probably the, the best picture of the love of God shown in a marriage relationship is the story of the Song of Solomon. Um, mm -hmm. it, it talks about a young man, uh, which is who is really God, the, the image, a young shepherd boy going out to woo a young dark-skinned maiden and she points out how ordinary and unspectacular she is and she lists all her faults and her shortcomings but yet this young shepherd boy continues to woo her and to tell her how much he loves her and how he cannot live without her. And then he leaves her, which is part of the tradition because he now goes away to build a house for her. And she pines while he's away. She says, where's he gone? Why has he left me? But he's gone to build a house for her so he can come back to marry her. And when he returns, there's a massive surprise for her. Because when he comes back, he reveals he's actually not a lowly shepherd boy. He is Solomon, the greatest, wisest, richest king that Israel has ever known. This king who could choose any woman in the land has chosen this plain, ordinary woman because he loved it. She is now going to move out of this little country cottage that she has into the palace that he has built for her. And she's going to live out her life in luxury with her lover, the king. What a wonderful picture of God's love for us and how the difference in status between us is so remarkable. And yet God still woos us and wants us to be part of him. So, so that intense love that a man and a woman feel for each other is a, is a small symbol of how intense God loves us. And think of all the covenant points that I've mentioned and how the blessings uh, that God has for us are built up in those seven points. Let's just run through them quickly. God has promised us that all of his strength, all of his wealth, all of his resources are for our benefit. That is just an incredible thing when you think we've got an, an infinite amount of resources at our disposal and God wants to give them to us. God has walked through death for us. He sacrificed his son and he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Look at what I'm prepared to do for you. I will never break this covenant. There's a permanent scar in God's body, as it were, because of what he's done, the covenant that he's made. In Revelation chapter 5, this is very interesting. When John is in heaven, he looks up and it says, I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. There were still the marks in the body which said something's happened to this person. Some damage has happened to you. I can still see the scars and the marks. In heaven, there is one person who is not going to have a perfect body, and that's Jesus. He will bear permanent scars as a result of his love for us. We spoke about the name changing. God actually calls us his children, and he calls us, says that he is our God. That is the relationship that he built. There's a monument, a permanent monument. At Calvary, there's a cross, which is a permanent monument to all generations of God's uh, love for us. Regularly, we take a meal of bread and wine, which is symbolic of that covenant relationship that we have. Uh, and we read out whatever we do it in, in Corinthians 11. Jesus said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. So although we weren't there to drink the meal at the time, we are like the children that came afterwards. We can drink and eat that meal as a reminder of the covenant. And then finally remember that all children are part of this covenant until they're old enough to reject it. Now I know many of you have had children who have died, babies that were born and died soon after, and you wonder, are they going to be in heaven one day? Well, according to the covenant that we see in Scripture, God has said, until those children are old enough to make a decision, they're his, they're part of that covenant. But we're human. We break covenants. We're not God. We're not infallible. We destroy marriages. Uh, they crumble and fall. We destroy God's image through our sinful actions. But God is able to restore what we break. When Paul is talking about marriage in Ephesians, there's a beautiful description of how God views us in terms of the marriage relationship. And in Ephesians 5, he says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy. Now, that already is an injunction to men, which is very difficult for us to, to follow. God is saying to men, as, as Christ sacrificed himself, 
he, he gave everything. The ultimate, he gave himself, he died. That is how husbands should love their wives, totally committed forever. But he said what Jesus did was he, he gave himself up to make her holy, to cleanse her by the washing with water through the Word. The Word is important. Every time you read the Bible, you have more of God's character coming into your life. But he said Jesus did this to cleanse his bride and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Notice, he didn't come looking for a perfect woman, a perfect queen. He said, I'm going to come down there to a very plain, ordinary, disheveled bride, and I'm going to make her into this perfect, spotless uh, being that I can marry. And so Jesus, when he died on the cross to make a covenant with us, it was part of his cleansing his bride getting her ready for for him for the marriage so we don't have to worry that we are not perfect that we that we do wrong things that we destroy god's image god understands that we we are human he came here to perfect us to make us better um, and so he wants to take us home to live with him eternally and he's in the process of turning us into his perfect spotless wonderful bride he loves us and has sacrificed everything for us. We need to make sure that we spend time in His presence. We need to read His Word to find out what it is that God wants us to do as He turns us into the, the image of His perfect bride. God bless you.